Okay, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so my topic is uh, non-horizontal mergers, and what I uh, intend to do is go through some of the uh, basics. Uh, if I can figure out how this, there we go. Um, uh, uh, but hopefully, uh, go through it in a way that you've not heard before, and then uh, turn to some of the anti-competitive effects that. Um, um, might, uh, might uh, occur from certain types of tying and conglomerate mergers and then move to some uh, new research. Um, in going through these topics, I will refer frequently to my own work, but I want to make clear my own work is building obviously on the significant work in the literature. And if you read my papers, you'll see I, I uh, cite that literature. The, the main reference, and I give some references at the end of the paper if you're interested in pursuing these topics in more detail, but one main reference I would give is my textbook that covers um, some of these topics in, in, uh, in great detail. Um, so let me turn to um, non-horizontal mergers. Let me first dis define it. Uh, a non-horizontal merger is a merger of firms that produce products that are complements to each other. Uh, so, for example, an operating system and a browser, uh, a machine and, uh, and its maintenance, its subsequent maintenance, cameras and film, um, a product and its distribution system. And because a product and its distribution system can be viewed as a type of non-horizontal merger, uh, much of what I have to say applies to vertical mergers. So vertical med mergers would be considered a special case, and many of the economic incentives I talk about will um, arise in vertical mergers. But let me begin with um, an efficiency justification discussion. And the reason I begin there is because most mergers um, based on a lot of studies that economists have done, uh, by and large are motivated by efficiency reasons. And that means you should be very reluctant to intervene uh, just based on theoretical possibilities in, in the absence of empirical evidence. So what are some standard efficiency explanations? Well, probably the most basic one is convenience. If you look at um, any product, an automobile, you can define it as a bundle of attributes, a steering wheel, uh, uh, an auto body, uh, wheels, and it's put together because uh, we like it uh, put together. We don't want to put together the car ourselves. Uh, that's important, and you'll see that a lot of uh, tie-in sales have to, if you're going to attack them, you have to make sure you're not attacking a product that's conveniently put together. But there are a lot of other reasons that could motivate Effic uh, efficiencies from a non-horizontal merger that have to do with uh, getting rid of um, inefficiencies that result from the exercise of market power. So suppose you're making an automobile uh, out of uh, al many things, but let's suppose aluminum and steel, and let's suppose there's a monopolist of aluminum, and let's suppose there's a monopolist of steel, and you're trying to figure out uh, if you're a car manufacturer, how much aluminum and how much steel to use. Well, um, that'll be based on the prices you're charged. Well, the aluminum monopolist will set a monopoly price for aluminum, taking the price of steel as given, and the uh, steel monopolist will do the same. Uh, that means um, that each monopolist will, in a sense, have an incentive to set their price too high because what they ignore is the effect of their increase in price on their um, uh, fellow supplier. So if I'm the aluminum monopolist and I raise my price, that'll cause the price of a car to go up, that'll cause the number of cars sold to go down, and that causes the amount of steel to go down that's demanded. And I don't take account of that. So that's called the Corno complements problem, but, and it's now appearing in a lot of other guises other than just manufacturing, and perhaps the guys I've seen it most in have been involved in some recent IP intellectual property cases involving uh, say Apple, um, um, where Frand, uh, what, a, what a fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory royalty rates, and when you start thinking about um, um, uh, producing um, a product wh which has standard essential patents, 
uh, each patent owner, if he's independent, can um, overprice uh, relative to the, the, efficient, uh, the, efficient, uh, the efficient price. And in a vertical setting, this Quinault complements problem uh, appears as um, the avoidance of double marginalization, which people have probably already heard of. Um, another efficiency uh, rationale that comes up all the time has to do with uh, variable proportions. So let's go back to my automobile example. Suppose in, uh, you again are making a car out of aluminum and steel. But now let me change my example so that steel is competitively produced, aluminum is still monopolized. Now the car producer in deciding what mix of aluminum and steel to choose will base his choice on the ratio of the monopoly price to the competitive price, which is a reflection of the marginal cost of steel. That leads to an economic inefficiency. Too little aluminum will be used, and therefore um, um, a common ownership or, um, of the aluminum and steel can solve that uh, can solve that problem. A good example, a good, uh, when this comes up, and there have been a lot of antitrust cases, at least in the United States, about this, has to do with a machine and its subsequent maintenance. And you can view the maintenance as extending the life of a machine and allowing the user of the machine to avoid having to buy a new machine uh, as frequently as it would if it didn't maintain it as at high, a high level. If the machine is monopolized, but maintenance is not, then you get an incentive to over-maintain machines because um, um, the monopoly price of a machine is not reflecting um, its, marginal, its marginal cost. And vertical integration into that setting can, um, um, or a non-horizontal merger can, uh, can solve that problem. There are also a lot of issues that are coming up now, and I expect more and more to occur, that have to do with um, um, uh, protection of property rights. And a good example, two firms um, um, are using uh, products and they each have databases on customers. The two firms are reluctant to share their databases prior to merger because once you share, you've shared a database, it becomes difficult to maintain proprietary interest in the database and get the data back. And that motivates um, a reluctance to share data, and you can get around that by having a conglomerate, uh, a conglomerate merger. Um, so let me now turn to a topic that is often uh, ignored, and it's that there are contract alternatives to mergers. If a merger is motivated by anti-competitive incentives, then those same incentives exist prior to the merger. And the question is, why don't you see contracts that are trying to implement the same things that you're worried about if you think there's going to be an anti-competitive merger? So if you think foreclosure is a problem, why don't you see, con prior to a merger, incentive for the use of contracts in which someone says, I will pay you X, but only on the assumption that you're not supplying my rival? Such contracts exist. In, in, our, in, in an economy generally, a lot of vertical contracts with restrictions, and therefore if you think, gee, I'm seeing a, a conglomerate merger, I think it's going to be anti-competitive, the very first question you should ask is, do I see contracts that are trying to do this? Um, so for example, um, in a lot of cases in the, in the United States before the FCC, in which you have for example, a cable company vertically integrating backwards into programming, if someone raises the concern, well, gee, I'm worried that the cable company will control programming and won't make it available to rivals, ask yourself, do you see such contracts? Because there are plenty of exclusive contracts in programming. And if you don't see such contracts pre-merger, why do you expect to see them post-merger? Well, that logic emphasizes that what you should be focused on if you think you see this, that there's, if you're worried about an anti-competitive effect of a conglomerate merger, is that the transaction costs somehow post-merger are going to be lower to carry out this foreclosure than prior to the merger. Now you might say, well gee, if the merger's illegal and violates the antitrust laws, so don't the contracts. 
But then you should ask yourself, and, and that's why you don't see the contracts. But then you should ask yourself the question, do you think it's easier to discover an anti-competitive contract or an anti-competitive merger that has to be announced and vetted before a government agency? Obviously, it's uh, scrutiny is heightened when there's a merger. So if you think there's an anti-competitive merger, that's your best time to find it out. And if you can't find any anti-competitive contracts that are harder to find out, that might tell you that absent a transaction cost advantage, you probably, from the merger, you're unlikely to see an anti-competitive merger. Um, let me say something, let me turn to the topic of price discrimination because my sense is that there's a confusion often between price discrimination and the strategic use of, say, foreclosure or tying to harm competition. Price discrimination need have nothing to do with a harm to competition. You can have price uh, discrimination even when there are no rivals. That tells you it has nothing to do with competition. It has to do with the ability to extract consumer surplus through, through various types of, of schemes that separate uh, uh, consumers. So there are a whole variety of ways in which um, a conglomerate merger uh, or tying or bundling uh, products can facilitate price discrimination. A standard example has to do with metering usage. So in the famous IBM tabulating machine case, the, in, the intensity of use of a tabulating machine depended upon how many cards you wanted to use. So the way IBM charged people for the machine was based on how many cards they used. That's a, a tie. It wasn't attempting to monopolize the, tie, the, the card market. There were perhaps plenty of um, competitive suppliers of cards, but the tie was designed just to um, uh, price discriminate. Mixed bundling, which came up in the GE Honeywell case that was referred to earlier, but it comes up in a lot of cases, um, is um, a pricing procedure in which you offer products separately and then as a bundle. And even in the absence of competition, that can be a standard way in which you try and, and uh, price discriminate. In the United States, there was a case called the LePage case that um, I thought are really, and many others, think uh, really confused price discrimination with um, strategic uh, anti-competitive behavior and did a very poor analysis. In a, uh, the, well, there was a congressional um, commission in the United States called the Antitrust Modernization Commission. Um, they decided they needed some economic um, reasoning on, on that commission, so I was, they decided to put one uh, economist out of uh, 12 members on the commission. As you can imagine, one economist has less than one twelfth the speaking time of 11 um, lawyers. But um, we heavily criticized the LePage decision uh, in, in, that, uh, in that report. Let me now turn to some um, more usual discussions um, of competitive harm. Uh, the problem with Antitrust cases that argue that there is foreclosure, and in the United States, unfortunately, the way several decisions uh, are written, uh, foreclosure, the word foreclosure appears, is that foreclosure appears when one competitor gets sales from another competitor. He can say, the, the, the competitor who doesn't get the sales can say, I'm foreclosed. And that's the big problem, distinguishing um, a real competition from foreclosure that is reflecting somehow increased market power. So here's a key principle to remember. We're always worried you hear this discussion about leveraging market power from one market into another. So here's the key principle to, um, to remember. Um, a firm with market power cannot extend it through merger unless the firm is gaining market power over additional customers or additional sales above and beyond those over which it already has market power. So let me try and illustrate that with, a, with, with an example, two examples. Um, and the fundamental work uh, here is by Winston. Um, let's suppose you imagine a resort island. There's a resort on the island, one hotel. It has market power. It's the only hotel on the island, and it's a very desirable place to go. 
Let's also suppose that there are natives who live on the island who work in the hotel, and um, they also go out to eat, like the tourists. So there are a lot of local restaurants. And now suppose the hotel requires the hotel guests to eat in the restaurant. Or another way of saying it is it lets them eat in the restaurant for free. Obviously, it includes it in the room, room price. As a result, the tourists don't eat in local restaurants. If there are economies of scale, perhaps that means there are many fewer local restaurants. Maybe, to keep it simple, they all go out of existence. They all go out of existence then when a native wishes to eat in a restaurant, there's only one on the island, the hotel restaurant. That's an example in which the hotel has acquired market power over, gr over a group of customers that it didn't have market power over already. It already had market power over the people who were coming to the resort island to stay in the hotel. It didn't have market power over the natives. That's an example. So what's a more realistic example? So Waldman and I work out this case in a, in, over time, in, in a dynamic setting. We apply it to, to, to Microsoft, Microsoft case. So imagine initially that um, you have Windows and you have a browser. Um, so you have product A, monopolized, product B, used with the um, a monopolized product. The question is, what is your reaction to rivals in product B, rival browsers? Well, if someone comes up with a better browser, a better product B, you might want to use it. Let people use it. Why? Because if they use a better product with Windows, they'll be willing to perhaps pay more for Windows. Windows becomes more useful. Let's now put that in a dynamic setting. Suppose in period two, what you're worried about if you're Microsoft is that there'll be a competitive product to Windows, another operating system. But for that operating system to have value, it has to have application programs. Well, let's suppose those application programs are what that rival product B firm can do, the rival browser, you can use the rival browser. Well, then Microsoft might say, gee, if I don't let the rival browser exist in period one, it won't be around in period two, and if it won't be around in period two, no rival to Windows can arise in period two. So in these dynamic settings, you can get a more realistic story as to how tying or bundling can preserve market power over time. And what you can show is in markets with high R&D that don't last long, with high fixed costs, those are the type of markets you want to look at. And if you look in, in our paper, we discuss how this type of analysis fits, say, Microsoft or uh, IBM um, over time, in which people swing their market power from one product to another product over time. And even though the products change tremendously over time, they remain um, in charge. Uh, but the lesson from that is this only will arise in very special circumstances. If there aren't scale economies, if there's competition, if markets are large, you can't expect this to, um, to occur. Um, in the few minutes uh, left, let me turn to um, some um, new research um, that uh, I, I just uh, published within the last few years with uh, Joshua Gans and um, uh, Michael Waldman. And what this research is trying to analyze is why some products are produced uh, together, bundled together, even though you're not that interested in um, one of the products, and very few people use it. And instead, what they do is they use a rival's product after they buy the, the bundled uh, product. And the question is, what's, what's going on? So um, you know, the, I'll, I'll leave you to read the paper to get the full details. Let me just try and explain some implications of the model and then give you an example. So the implication of the model will be there will be an incentive to bundle a product that people don't really care about very much. People won't use that product. They'll instead buy a rival's product after they buy the bundle. This is going to be inefficient behavior. It's very unclear 
whether this should be an antitrust violation. Probably not. And it has a rather unusual antitrust implication. So rather than going through the details of the paper, let me just give you an example. Again, let me use um, um, Windows in Microsoft. Suppose I go to buy Windows. It'll become bundled with many different application programs. Now, I like that because it's put together for me. And that's convenience, uh, provides a convenience uh, for me. But let's suppose one of the programs is not that good compared to what I can buy at a software store. Um, uh, and I will uh, buy it. And Microsoft allows me to use other application programs that are superior, that I find superior to the ones they've come bundled. Well, obviously, that's inefficient behavior because Microsoft has gone to the trouble of bundling it. And um, now I'm not going to use that product. Why are they doing it? The reason, and we go through this in the paper, is because when I am deciding how much I'm willing to pay for the rival product, if I already have the bundle, I'm only willing to pay the incremental value over the bundle. Now that incremental value over the bundle, when I'm figuring out how do I value the bundle, includes the fact that the con there's a convenience from having Microsoft bundled products together. And in a sense, Microsoft is able to capture some of that when it's the bundle they, that I buy and I'm deciding whether to buy the rival's product. If instead the products were sold separately, then uh, when I'm deciding whether to buy the rival product or the Microsoft product, I just buy the one I, I prefer and no one gets the benefit of the convenience of uh, Microsoft having bundled the product. The end result of all this is by bundling, Microsoft is able to transfer profits and lower the price that the rival product can charge and is able to increase the price of the bundled product. So it's a way Microsoft can transfer products from the rival to itself. And what's interesting about this case, and the reason I raise it after I've just talked about foreclosure, is because this practice, which is actually pretty common, we see people often bundling products that then don't get used uh, extensively. Uh, the reason it's occurring has nothing to do with foreclosure. It, in fact, is the reverse. It requires someone to like the rival product and use it. That's why I'm, I, I think it's an interesting uh, contrast. Now, here's the unusual antitrust implication. You might think if Microsoft said, ah, I want, ver I want to purchase that superior rival, that, gee, that's going to cut down on competition between Microsoft's product and the rival's product. And, you know, you, you can see why you might say that, especially for R&D competition. But the other effect is it gets rid of an economic inefficiency gets rid of an economic inefficiency, so therefore it's efficient to do. And now it's, 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 it's much less clear whether an antitrust authority really has any business intervening because it's generating an efficiency as a result of this, uh, this transaction. So uh, let me end there. Um, let me um, uh, encourage you to look at some of these references if you'd like more details on any of these, uh, these points. And the, um, I think the one, line summary of um, my views on uh, attacking non-horizontal mergers is be really careful because attacking them should be done only rarely. Well, thank you very much.